Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's session on holistic education and its linkages with industry and employability. The national edu and skill development, of course, sir. The National Education Policy 2020 lays emphasis on critical thinking and a holistic education system which is relevant, learner-centered, and driven by innovation and inquiry. This is imperative to develop a well-rounded and employable individual. The policy seeks to achieve this by integrating skilling and industry academia linkage in schools as well as higher educational institutions. Today's session provides us an opportunity and a platform to gain the academic and industry perspective on this vision of the NEP, including underlying challenges and the probable solutions. To help us in this journey, we have today with us Dr. Anunne Chaube, Provost Anant National University, Gujarat. He's a well-known artist and academic in the fields of literature and art history. He has a PhD in English literature with a specialization in modern poetry and criticism. Over the, over the past 10 years, he has taught courses on art appreciation, economics, entrepreneurship, environment, media, and journalism around the world. At Anant, he is focused on building a design university with a strong liberal arts foundation. We also have with us Sri Satish Pradhan, currently an independent consultant advising boards and companies on strategy, leadership, and HR. Sri Pradhan retired as advisor, Tata Sons Limited, in 2015. He has a master's in history from Delhi University and has worked in several public and private sector companies over the last 40 years in varying capacities. Sri Pradhan is an avid naturalist and continues to be associated with a large number of institutions in environmental, community, and education areas in an advisory capacity. Moving on, we, all, we are also joined today by Sri Manish Sabarwal, an MBA from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Sri Sabarwal is a vice chairman of Team Lease Services, India's largest staffing and human capital firm. Team Lease has over 300,000 employees in 5,000 plus cities and has sponsored India's first vocational university. Team Lease operates India's fastest growing national PPP apprenticeship program and is listed on National Stock Exchange. We were also supposed to uh, be joined by Dr. Abhay Jere, but uh, uh, he is not here as yet, so we'll move on. We also have on stage Sri Narayanan Ramaswamy, Head Education, Skill Development, and Social Sector Advisory Vertical, KPMG India. With an education journey that took him from Madurai Kamraj University to IIM Bangalore, and finally Harvard University, Mr. Ramaswamy has over 29 years of experience in management consulting and industry. His engagements span across India, ASEAN, Middle East, and African regions, and key multilateral and bilateral agencies like the World Bank, ADB, USAID, etc. He has been associated with several government committees on education and skill development, as also of forums such as CII and FICI. Finally, today we also have with us Ms. Anjali Hans, a commerce business economics student. Ms. Hans is the President, Telecom Sector Skill Council, and Vice President, Regulatory and Corporate Affairs, Vodafone IDEA. She has been associated with the telecom industry for nearly 25 years. Her experience in the telecom sector ranges from policy to regulatory and legal issues to engagement with government and other key external stakeholders. She moved to Vodafone in 2010 and became a part of the Vodafone IDEA team in 2018. Before we commence the session, may I now request Secretary of Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship to please hand over the mementos to the panelists. First, we have uh, the chair of the session, Dr. Anunya Chaube. Then we have Sri Satish Pradhan. We then have Sri Manish Sabarwal. Moving ahead, we have 
श्री नारायणन रामास्वामी Finally, we have Miss Anjali Hans. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Abhay Jere, who has just joined us for this session. Thank you, sir. I'll briefly introduce Dr. Abhay Jere uh, to the session. Dr. Abhay Jere is Vice Chairman AICT and the Chief Innovation Officer, Ministry of Education. Dr. Jere has been instrumental in the conceptualization of various key initiatives of the ministry, like Smart India Hackathon and Atal Innovation Ranking Framework, ARIA. Through the ministry, Dr. Jere has also established Institutions Innovation Council across 1,000 institutions to facilitate creation of local innovation ecosystem. I now request Dr. Chaube, chair of today's session, to commence the discussion and moderate the deliberations. Sir. Sure. Hello and uh, welcome to this session. We have uh, four very interesting and very seminal themes out here on which we have uh, uh, experts who really define you know, the functioning of each of these themes across the country. And I think it will be a very uh, enriching experience and thought-provoking experience and session you know, so for us all here. And the expressions are, of course, you know, so holistic education, and how it could be brought about with the help of skilling, industry connect, leading to employability across educational institutions, you know, say at, at the school level and of course, you know, say at the higher education level as well. What exactly is holistic education? I happen, I went to a school and then I went to a college in the university that I attended and the society that I belong to and my family, you know, so they were all keen that I become a specialist. And I'm sure that, you know, the, the similar experience uh, would be out there, you know, so with uh, most of you, if not with all of you. The insistence on specialization, right? And in this context, there's a quote that I would just like to read out to you. It, it, it's a quote that comes from one of the triumvirates of science fiction writers, um, Isamova, Arthur C. Clarke, and there was this other one, you know, who started it all, uh, Robert E. Heinlein. And those who are interested in science fiction, you know, say, would uh, also be familiar with this particular name. So the quote is something like this. And what, what he's trying to communicate through the quote is his expectation of a human being. And of course, you know, it's going to be in contrast for our insistence on specialization, right? He says, a human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, Program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. And unfortunately, in my experience of uh, being, you know, in a school studying and later, you know, in the university, and then last 34 years that I have been teaching and also administering institutions, I think. This is exactly what we've been trying to do, you know, specialize in something at the cost of so many other, you know, engagements uh, and skills that we could have developed, skills that we are perhaps born with. You know, promise that we have, you know, say this, this uh, innate talent that we would have, you know. And I have seen so many of my school friends, you know, so of course, you know, so growing up, and I'm talking about kids who would have this intelligence at, say, music, or, uh, 
you know, sports or writing or painting, all kinds of intelligence that are there and how our system would push a kid and of course, you know, the society as well, to push out or throw out all these innate talents or, or strengths that we would have out of the window and insist that you specialize, you score. The insistence on grades, because grades would help you, you know, get into, say, the rat race and help you win that rat race. So this insistence on specialization leading to great scores and leading to perhaps, you know, say, great uh, employment. You know, this is how it has gone. But the employment sector, you know, so would have a different story. Do they really want, you know, so such uh, uh, rigid thinking, straight jacketed, you know, linear thinking, uh, cadres, you know, to employ? And that is something that we'd be looking at again, you know, or, or would we need, you know, this uh, young cohort of holistically um, thinking, comprehensive, uh, with comprehensive understanding of how the society functions, somebody who is rich and well-versed in system thinking, you know, so would understand that the world is a very complex place. It's made up of parts, and these parts are interconnected, right? How do we actually help our students develop such an understanding? And of course, you know, so this understanding won't come if we continue to be, you know, to be focusing, you know, on one, attaining one particular goal. Right, at the cost of so many other things that we could have acquired and developed perhaps a holistic thinking. So what we have been trained to do in my experience, what I have seen happening, is you continue to look at the world from the window of that specialization that you have attained. Right? It could be anything, any of those knowledge disciplines. Forgetting that that is not the view of the world that is the ultimate or the real view of the world. What we need our students to understand and acquire is the fact that the world would appear or looks different from the windows of different specializations. So if you're looking at the world from the window of, say, technology, there is a limited picture that you get. If you look at it from the picture of all the social sciences subjects like economics or sociology or maybe even anthropology and others, you know, philosophy, there are different pictures that emerge. And at the end of the day, at the, the end of your learning, and there is no end, Right? This is something that you continue to do. You keep learning all your life, and you go on adding you know, to whatever your experience of life is. You add up all these pictures to create a composite understanding of how the system works. And this awareness, this knowledge of the whole society and its different uh, functions, activities, being interconnected it what is, is what I think really leads to a holistic learning. And uh, I dare say that our students, you know, say, even today, to some extent, but of course, with, uh, are, are deficient in this understanding of uh, society as uh, an organism with different parts. You know, so we just tend to look at its part one particular, you know, aspect of it. But of course, the new education policy, and I really applaud it, has come up now. You know, say with this. Um, is aware of this and is trying to sort things out. And this is exactly what we are here to do, to look at how holistic education could be strengthened through more richer, you know, exposure of our young learners and learners at, uh, you know, higher levels with institutions that are actually working, you know, so call them industries, but before, and, and what it is that they stand to acquire from it, you know, a range of skills. With holistic exposure, with a wider exposure, you know, so looking out at the world you know, from different windows, what is expected is that you get this big picture and you also, you know, say find, you know, acquire different uh, insights, inputs, skills, you know, uh, at, at analyzing, interpreting, understanding the world. And if you understand the world better, if you look at it from different, you know, uh, perspectives, you have a holistic and a comprehensive understanding, in a way, of how the world works, what are the, how, how is it so nuanced, right? And if you do that, if you see it better, you're also in a better position to solve problems. You become a player in the industry that is perhaps more versatile, that is more flexible, that is, the turnaround time is quicker, and perhaps, you know, so such a person with holistic uh, uh, exposure would not turn out to be someone 
in the industry who is rigid, preconditioned to an extent, you know, where, 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 where this uh, rigidity, you know, so becomes brittle and break and non-productive. So this is what we are here to uh, dwell on. This is what we are to consider, right? So now I would be inviting uh, <coughs> Mr. Subberwall, uh, an expert, a stalwart in the field of employment and employability, you know, to consider different uh, aspects of this issue. Please, Mr. Sabawa. Thank you, sir. So, I, I'm really here as an employer. You know, we've hired somebody every five minutes for the last um, 20 years, but we have only hired 5% of the kids who came to us for a job. So, the demand side, we sort of put out a sign outside our Bombay office that trespassers will be recruited. But um, on the supply side, it's clear to me that the two most important decisions a child in India makes are to choose your parents wisely and your PIN code wisely. Um, why did this happen or why does this happen? I, and, it, and it's important to understand the demand side because we are in a session for employers and while I know that universities think em employers should pray to them, I think universities in the, in the future will have to think about um, at least a center of gravity with employers that I know a lot of people will talk about that. But the demand side on the <coughs> exit gate of the education system, we don't have a jobs problem in India, we have a wages problem. I keep saying this again and again. Unemployment in India has been between 4 and 7% since 1947 and that is not a fudge. Um, but that is built or sustained by self, not self-employment, by self-exploitation of most people. So. The productivity of our cities has to go up, the productivity of our states has to grow up, the productivity of firms has to go up, the productivity of our sectors has to go up, and the productivity of our individuals has to go up. And we can spend a lot of time on that, but um, you know, my parents live in UP, I live in Karnataka. Both states have the same GDP, but Karnataka does it with one-fourth the number of people. Um, if you think about cities, if everybody in India lived in Bangalore, our GDP would be more than China. Right? India's GDP is $2,500, Bangalore's GDP is now $12,000. If you think about sectors, IT, which is a rounding error in the labor market, it's only 0.8% of our labor force, it generates 8% of GDP. You know, farming is 40% of our labor force, it only generates 16% of GDP. And obviously, individually, and for a kid the same age and job description exactly the same and technically the same paper qualifications, I pay four times the difference in salary based on what we can debate. So, on the demand side, it's clear that our 63 million enterprises, 12 million don't have an office, 12 million work from home, only 12 million are registered for GST, only 8 million pay GST. There are only 23,500 companies in India with a paid up capital of more than 10 crores. So, in this room, obviously, we have to recognize that the regulatory cholesterol or the lack of infrastructure or whatever it is, we have a demand side um, problem, which is in the process of being transformed. But on the supply side, there are clearly three problems, right? Matching, mismatch, and pipeline. Matching is really connecting supply to demand. Mismatch is repairing supply for demand. And pipeline is preparing supply for demand. And there are, at least in my mind, the only way you can reconcile these three. You know, these three planes, you know, Ministry of Employment is Ministry of Labor. We don't have a Ministry of Employment in India, right? But we have a Ministry of Labor, which has one perspective. We have a Ministry of Education, which has another perspective, and a Ministry of Skills, which uh, is newly formed, but had a different perspective. We're finally seeing that convergence a, under one minister, and B, obviously, under NEP, which for me was always obvious, right? Because of the five design principles, anything in India you do is not interesting unless it's scalable, generalizable, and replicable, right? I'm not interested in that stupid story about one classroom in the middle of some rural area where one teacher helped 20 kids. I think that's very nice, but that's not going to solve India's problem, right? And so the five design principles, which at least I've learned at 20 years at the exit gate of the education system, which India will have to uniquely adopt, are obviously learning by doing. You know, soft skills are not taught, they are caught. We are worried about soft skills, not as much about hard skills. Learning while learning. You know, in India will be the first country, if we do this right, where employed learners will cross full-time learners. Today, our education system focuses on full-time learners. We need learning with modularity. Three-month certificate should be opening balance for one-year diploma, for two-year advanced diploma and three-year degree. We're on our way with that. We need learning with flexible delivery. An online classroom, on-job classroom, on-site classroom, and on-campus classroom should be equal. And we need learning with signaling value, an employer signaling value, not social signaling value. 
you know, Mr. Satyana and I now the director of I IIT is sitting here. IITs are a good place to be at, but a better place to be from, right? <laughs> the fundamental value is being from IIT, not being at IIT, at least in my mind. You know, I went to Wharton, that's the fundamental value of going to Wharton is being from there, not being there. So how do we solve this problem? I think fundamentally in my mind, there's been a lot of innovation in curriculum, pedagogy and many things. We have not done enough innovation in financing. Who pays? Everybody's trying to toe people now the other person, right? Kids want parents to pay, parents want government to pay, government wants employers to pay. And it's not clear to me that employers can manufacture our own employees. We can repair our own employees, but we cannot manufacture or prepare our own employees. And fundamentally, there are three holes in the bucket in financing. We pay for training, the kid doesn't get a job. You pay for training, the kid gets a job, but is not productive. You pay for training, the kid gets a job, is productive, but he leaves. <laughs> so fundamentally, learning risk, attrition risk, and productivity risk means that you're always sitting with the HR head rather than the CFO. So if you want companies to manufacture their own employees, we have to shift our, our financing to the CFO where we make the case that because of lower attrition, higher productivity, and faster time to hire, actually you have a capex hurdle rate of 12% for your capex, we apprenticeship programs or skill development programs or work integrated learning programs give you a much higher um, return than 12%. So if you think about where, how you will solve this financing problem, I don't have that many solutions, at least in my mind degree apprenticeships sort of get there. Designing degree apprenticeships with flexible delivery, which is four classrooms, designing degree apprenticeships with certificate, diploma, advanced diploma, and degree being one connectivity, designing degree apprenticeships with stipends which allow a reasonable subsidy of the kids who are migrating to the bigger cities where the jobs are, and obviously um, a huge component of learning by doing, because then you catch the skills rather than worry about them being taught. I think that this is, has to be a uniquely Indian solution, right? I'm sick and tired of listening about Singapore, Finland, or Germany, right? Because Singapore spends $13,000 a year on a plumber in the IT system. We spend that much on IIT, so we're not going to spend with them. Cost, quality, and quantity are a very difficult trade-off. You know, Finland has probably less people than Charni Chowk or whatever, so it's very interesting, but it's not as scalable and replicable for us. And obviously the German Minister of Vocational Training has had a bet with me that India will, you will not be able to manufacture your own employees. You employers are overselling what you can do. I disagree with him because obviously 45% um, of children in, in India are already in private schools. That's the highest in the world. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. But I think if we hadn't had that private sector response in K-12 education, I can't imagine where the system would be. So I think you know, there was a 1960s book by John Gardner called Can We Be Equal and Excellent? And that is at the heart of this session, right? Because if you, if you want to be equal, you really have to think about employability, employment, and education as a continuum. But if you want to be excellent, you have to do small numbers. But I think NEP finally gives us some sort of roadmap. I'm happy to detail why I think financing and degree apprenticeships are really the solution are one solution to this, but there are obviously going to be many more which we'll hear. Thank you. Um, so quite obviously, you know, so there, there is a problem out there about skilling and, and the cost component of it. And uh, I hope that there would be a few uh, questions on it, I'm sure. I would now be requesting uh, Mr. Pradhan um, to talk about the ecosystem of industry and the academia, and of course with a focus on the individual that comes out of the academia and joins the industry. Thank you very much, Chairman, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you, uh, particularly educationist luminaries, policy makers, and uh, educators in general, and all of you here. Uh, I'm going to start off with a reference to the NEP, which is my understanding of it, uh, and pull out something which I think is relevant to this conversation. Uh, the, one of the essentials of the NEP speaks to the point of learning to learn. And I think it makes a lot of sense to us uh, cognitively uh, 
but in the translation, I think there are opportunities for us to look at in the context of integrating skilling industry and connecting employability. Uh, to me, there are four different ways of looking at it, uh, or perhaps nuanced ways. One, of course, is, is fundamental, which is building intentionality. Uh, financial motives are very important for all of us as individuals, as institutions, and as corporate entities. But the intentionality of pursuing an education or a certification or a qualification or a line of study, a pasture to explore and gain from, uh, constitute different energy sources in addition to and perhaps nuance the financial part of it. Uh, the second thing that I think is part of this is the focus on thinking. We pay lip service, perhaps, and I'm being harsh, uh, to nudging for or demanding creative thinking, uh, all kinds of attributes of thinking. But our pedagogy, unfortunately, still is concentrated on content rather than process and context. So making sense uh, of the content is less important than being able to demonstrate a familiarity and an, un, an, an ability to reproduce the content. And I say this, I know it is harsh, I know it is changing, but I still think it has a drag on the changes we want to bring about. Uh, the third thing is multidisciplinarity. Uh, bluntly, we still are besotted by the tyranny of the taxonomy of, ec of educational disciplines. What do I mean by that? Biology is my field, it is my turf, it has its own uh, dharma shastra, and you keep your mechanical engineering somewhere else. If we come together, we'll come together on contractual terms. Yeah? Uh, that, to my mind, is not multidisciplinarity. And so, therefore, the question of what does really multidisciplinarity... If it walked into the room, how would I recognize multidisciplinarity? If it walked into my classroom, how would I recognize it? That's a question I want to leave. The other is the aspiration to have unified and integrated learning. That, perhaps, is the biggest and most ambitious statement, uh, which I think I'm proud of the fact that we've made that in the policy. But it is a huge ask. The enabling of connections, interdependencies, and linkages in the way we think about reality and our way forward in it is not trivial. And I'm not preaching, I'm merely cautioning us. It took me a lifetime to get my mind around even the basic words that I, so maybe I'm handicapped, but whatever. It is a challenge and I'd like to flag it off and leave it there. So to me, the linkages between the areas we want to explore are a thread between education, skilling, and employability, a thread between aspiration or intentionality, capability, access and opportunity for good and gainful work. I may create it for myself in an entrepreneurial mode as a startup. I may participate in an existing corporate venture uh, with the same thread. But it needs to be targeted at what is good and gainful work for me as an individual. To me, that's an important end point to not lose sight of. Um, the other point which I'm just going to underline it, as Manish said it very well, education needs to be both wider and deeper. And it needs to be fit for purpose. From an industry viewpoint, perhaps many parts of the industry today who seek Manish's help or um, Anjali to work inside the corporation on these things, uh, you need a coder. 
you don't need them to know social sciences, you don't need them to know chemistry, that you don't need them to know anything other than efficient, productive coding in Python. That's the job description, that's the target. And then Manish is trying to find those people who fit that job description, despite all his, and, and I know this from the firm itself and from him, uh, and what he's done in the past 25 years. The intent of creating sustainable capability remains a fond wish. You end up in the market having to service that job description at a very tactile level. And that's the dynamic in the marketplace that we need to understand, which leads me on to the whole notion of what does this uh, so-called partnership between industry and academia mean? I, I see a lot of faces here, particularly my dear friend Shalini ji from TIS. Partnering with industry is not new. A lot of you are doing it and doing, under the current circumstances, a commendable job. But it's not enough. The bar is higher for us. If we have the aspirations of the NEP, this is not going to get us there. We need to do much more. So what would I nudge us towards? I think the first thing to do is to understand the difference between a, sorry for the choice of metaphor, that, that's what comes to my mind, um, a live-in relationship and a committed relationship. Industry and institutions of ed education, particularly higher education, need to find ways of a committed relationship. Uh, I leave that for you to think about. Uh, we, we really do need to get beyond the industry metaphor of deals. We're very good in the industry to making, cracking deals, you know? And ensuring we don't leave money on the table, if you understand that metaphor from a business point of view. And deals on one side, dole on the other side. Uh, Manish mentioned that in a very polite way. I'm trying to be a little more colorful about it. Uh, who's going to bear the cost? Somebody's going to give us a dole. Either UGC will give us a dole, government will give us a dole, or corporate uh, world will give us a dole, or some foundation like Asim Premji or somebody will put good money into this and it will happen. But as a person who is hiring, I am not very sure I want to pay that price. And that's, that's a challenge we've got to work at. I'm just flagging that up. One of the ways in which I think that challenge can be dealt with in, in addition to what does a long-term relationship look like, uh, not only does research and academic work need to provide for the immediate needs of industry. I need a coder, I need a Python coder, please give me one, you know, and here's the ticket price, we are done and dusted. Uh, but to also build longitudinal studies and commitment to a pathway of sustainable employability. What happens to the coder after, you know, they've done two years of coding? Please remember our demographic dividend is pumping employable age people of the same kind that, and I'm just using the Python coder as an example, of the same kind at a rate which is exponentially growing. And if somebody tells me that the rate of Python coding jobs are going to exponentially increase, uh, I would want to look at that very closely. Because I think employability and employment need to find some kind of demand supply balance. And all three of the universes that are represented in this room, policy makers, educators, and industry, need to work this out together. We are still trying to solve these problems separately. And we are still trying to march to different drummers uh, and look like a common parade. Uh, harsh, but I think if I don't address this, 
I don't think I'm going to be able to make that change happen in institutions that I'm associated with. Uh, Final point on that, uh, and, and again goes back to something that was said earlier, domain expertise and the desire, the intentionality for dominance in a domain has to be a common characteristic that brings industry and academia together with policy and regulation. Um, sir, your universe and uh, UGC's universe, enabling that to happen. If we can enable it appropriately, and we can find those spaces where they can, the model of committees of FIKI or, sorry, I don't want to take names, various industry bodies and associations have not been successful. We've only scratched the surface. We're doing more of what we were doing earlier in a slightly refined way, and there is some progress, obviously. But it's not the kind of scalable model that we'll be able to. So what, what do I mean by the stretch? Industry needs to stretch from interest in immediate profits and profit alone to what Manish beautifully described as the capital expenditure in investment for capabilities in, a, in treating talent and capabilities as a supply chain. Uh, building, process, not just the product, the person who walks into your door, but the process by which that fit for purpose capability is going to be continuously created in my workforce as well as in the people that they put out of the university. The academic stretch is going to be, and, and this is for um, what I call collective and cumulative wisdom, society, uh, country, company, domain, company, individual. That's the hierarchy. And if we are committed to that, we will find these useful ways of getting further. Uh, in academia, we need to stretch away from, and I'm sorry, I'm guilty of some harshness here again, from my research, my publications, my brand, my department, my institution, and my field of work. Sometimes field of work has far greater loyalty and divisive force than the unification of something larger like the institutional reputation. It, it, it's something which may sound like it's a wishful thought, but it's going to be a condition of success. Uh, we also need to leverage both the startup and the standing strong. I think we've been uh, pushed a bit to the other end of the field by the appeal of and the glitz of uh, startups, and they are important, but they're two legs. We need to also make sure the large employers who are standing strong, we are leveraging that also as an employability avenue to ride on that. Uh, so I'm going to end with a visual model which I hope will make sense to you. We've talked about technology, we've talked about uh, how in, in this entire con samagan uh, about various kinds of technical capabilities. And I want you to visualize two axes. From left to right, we are talking about low tech, which is the kind of stuff we are today mostly doing in agriculture or in uh, menial jobs. Uh, shallow tech, which is where a lot of the uh, automation of repeatable boring tasks has begun to happen in a significant way. Then there is low tech, which is technology. The high tech innovators might look at that as low tech, yeah, or medium tech. But deep tech is really where the action is. And deep tech goes into things like, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to take a little bit of a moment and explain this. I was on the board of NPCI uh, when we went from pre-UPI demonetization to post-UPI 
uh, post demonetization UPI. Before UPI, uh, the demonetization, the dream was one billion transactions a day. And I leave you to discover what the number was at that time. But it was abysmal compared to that target. We hit one billion, or that company hit one billion in January this year. One billion transactions a day. That required a platform which had deep tech in it. So I'm just saying from the outside, not as people in the field of digital technology or computing or whatever, but that's what is the kind of effect that we need to have. So that's one scale. The other scale is what is it that the world will get by way of automation? So automation at low tech, automation at high tech, and at the other end of the vertical spectrum is augmentation. Why is it relevant to employability and industry connect? Automation will take away jobs. Simple, we, we are trying to create productivity by putting in more people you know, into other kinds of jobs, but taking away people and replacing them with automated processes. High level of productive functionality will be built in there, good for the economy. It could lead to jobless growth. Unless we move up the curve and say, whatever technology we bring in will augment human effort. Now I need those augmenters also. I just don't need the skilly, what we call skills today. Good butcher, good carpenter, good uh, electrician, technician, you uh, ITI qualified kind of, which is where most employers tend to look at in terms of skills. And then you graduate into more sophisticated but few number descriptions of life skills and you know um, other stuff. But on this grid, if we start plotting, what are we trying to target? And this is the basis of our partnership with industry and education. I think we have a great opportunity. Um, finally, I'd just like to say one very simple five A's. Both industry and education need to look at the emerging context with an agile response together, with an adaptive response together, with an anticipation of unknowns of the future and provisioning pathways for that. We're not used to that. We're used to thinking in a linear direction, plan has to succeed and that's it. Uh, and advancement for the individual in both income and capabilities on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pradhan. Uh, your uh, belief that there needs to be a committed relationship between education and industry, of course, uh, under the guidance of uh, policies and regulatory uh, supervision. So I would now be inviting Dr. Abhijere to uh, present some of these regulatory, the dimension, you know, of the whole relationship. Six minutes, six, seven minutes to talk. So I think the set is staged for a regulatory person to actually share with you what we are doing on the ground to address some of the key issues which were raised here. And people were talking about skills, Pradhan sir spoke about skills when it comes to carpentry and so and so but we also believe and we all should realize that when we are thinking about holistic development how to think is also very important skill which we really need to nurture because that is where we are currently lacking and we realized this very key deficient aspect 
and I'm very happy to share with you. Because I will be talking about the interventions which we are doing, which I think you will like to hear. Because broader picture has already been covered by my earlier speakers and the subsequent speakers will also talk about it. So the first very important aspect which we did was that we sat with CBSC and told them that if you have to promote these kind of skills, we have to have right kind of mindset. And I'm very happy to share with you that with CBSC, we have already released textbooks from 6th standard to 12th standard on design thinking. I don't know how many of you will be aware, but textbooks are already there on CBSC. And India is the first country to actually come up with a design thinking aspect. And it is a part of skill which we have put. India is the first country to do that. Apart from it, when we are looking at holistic education, there is, because I represent a technical body, approval body, facilitator body, we have now started giving huge emphasis on ethics, moral values, human, universal human values. And we have introduced an induction, a compulsory induction program, three-week induction program, within our educational institutions, technical educational institutions, before the start of actual program, which will cover all these aspects. Because we have to ensure uh, that when we are developing or when we are creating a technocrat, he should be socially spiritually, ethically relevant. And the steps we have taken in that direction already for last two years, three years that is happening and we have started really getting good outcome out of it. Another important aspect related to again skilling which we realized when we did a Stanford study where we compared the problem solving abilities of Indian students with international students we realized that they were far below par. And we have initiated a program called as Parak, which is completely based on learning based outcomes. You know, we are in touch with more than maybe uh, 500, 600 faculty members with whom we are actually designing a question bank, which is based on learning based outcomes for engineering students. Currently, we are actually uh, testing this model with the technical institution, uh, technical students, and that has started happening. So I will also re request you to look into these initiatives, like Parak initiative, which is there, and I would like to take this in, uh, uh, opportunity to actually go ahead and appeal all of you to join us in that. Then, a lot of internship initiatives we have taken, we already have offered 26 lakh internship initiatives. 26 lakh internships have been offered. If you will really go ahead and check on AICT's website, we have an internship portal. We have huge uh, database of industry connects. But when we are looking at this actually holistically, I have two or three things which I would like to actually pinpoint because majority of the people here are faculty members or institution leaders. That when we are discussing about holistic education through industry connect and we talk about this industry academia, distrust between industry, distrust between academia. Sometime people on both the sides don't actually realize the gravity of what we are trying to achieve. Satish sir said about industry should do more and those kind of things. <coughs> I certainly come from industry and I will share with you something which no industry will talk about in open public. The words are going to be harsh, but 
when we are looking at industry academia connect when we are looking at actually sending our students for internships because research that's a very different domain we can talk about it but i am actually talking from a skilling perspective we are pushing our institutions and we are telling them that go and do an industry connect so every institution is trying to do multiple mous with multiple organizations you know humne paanch mous sign kar de humne 10 mous sign kar de you know us mous pe kitna hota hai kya hota hai wo alag ki baat hai right jyada to to kuch hota nahi hai but even kuch hota hai industry is also obliged sometimes because of the relationships industry takes students but have anyone really looked at what happens when the student is within the industry for the internship many times we have observed because i am from an industry we don't care many times ke student aake kar kya raha hai wo yahan wahan ghumta hai khata hai peeta hai kuch copy pasting karta hai control c control v karta hai chala jata hai अगर हम इंटरव्यू भी पूछेंगे लोगों से कि हम इतना मेहनत करते हैं इंडस्ट्री एकेडमिया इतनी बातें होती हैं आप क्यों नहीं यूज करते हैं इन बच्चों को तो बहुत बार ये होता है कि मैं इसको ट्रेनिंग दे दूंगा इफ आई हैव टू ट्रेन दिस पर्सन ही विल ही इज हेयर फॉर वन मंथ टू मंथ थ्री मंथ i will not able to extract anything from him okay but i am investing time on him yeah ethically morally yes it's right we have to do that industry has to do that but bahut baar ye bhi internal discussions hote hain ki hum training institute hai ya industry hai hamara kaam kya hai wealth creation hai अगर ट्रेनिंग ही करते बैठेंगे तो धंधा कब करेंगे लेकिन ये कोई बोलता नहीं है स्टेज पे स्पेशली खड़े हो बिकॉज इट इज नॉट वेरी पॉलिटिकली करेक्ट बट व्हाट आई वुड लाइक टू से विदर वी कैन चेंज दिस विदर इट कैन बी इमीजिएटली डन इट्स नॉट इट्स नॉट वेरी इजी बट एटलीस्ट वेन वी आर सेंग दैट देर हैज टू बी एन इंडस्ट्री कनेक्ट एंड यू एक्सपेक्ट इंडस्ट्री टू गो अहेड एंड टेक सम ऑफ योर स्टूडेंट from skilling's perspective what you are doing to ensure that those students when get into industry are actually helpful or productive to them at least right kind of mindset se to bhej sakte hain wo nahi hota hai msmes mein bhej sakte hain jahan bachchon ki zarurat hai wahan jaate nahi hain because there is not not kind of right counseling within the institutions okay. on one side msme wants people who can come and help them but all our institutions especially higher institutions jo uh, they want that kind of an mou stamp ke humne microsoft se kiya humne tata se kiya humne isse kiya humne usse kiya and because of that many of the students who could actually learn are not learning these are the ground facts which i am actually sharing with when we are talking of all this is pura ka pura ye ek certificate to hai kya chahiye certificate leke ja baba tang mat kar do we get into that mode because i have been in the i, I was heading an r&d for a very big institute i had about 100 phd students but ye hota hai to ye na ho iske liye hum kya kar sakte hain as an educational institute that also we have to really look into and finally before we actually close down on this or before i conclude i also would like to ask how many of you are looking at this holistic education from a real life long learning perspective may many times it happens that is and there will be lot of 
faculty members and uh, from private organizations or local government organizations also. We look at a student as a customer for those three, four, five years. And we make his life hell. To yaha nahi aaya, iska late fee dete. Ye toda, iska paisa dete. उससे दो हजार पांच हजार दस हजार रुपया वसूल करने के पीछे हम बड़े रहते हैं राइट बिकॉज वी आर इन दिस क्वार्टर टू क्वार्टर पी एन एल और यहां एकेडमिक ईयर टू एकेडमिक ईयर पी एन एल पे काम कर रहे बट बिकॉज ऑफ ऑल दिस वॉट हैपन्स इज दैट दैट स्टूडेंट जनरेट सो मच ऑफ नेगेटिविटी टूवर्ड्स दैट इंस्टीट्यूशन that when he is out of the institution he doesn't want to look back at that institution means what our educational institutions are not considering our student as a partner for next 20 years next 50 years wo to 22 saal mein nikal jata hai na institute se uske 5000 wahan ka recover karne ke baad you actually lose what he can contribute when he is 40 where he can pay in lakhs and that's where the us universities and other foreign universities actually make a difference where they consider their student as a lifelong stakeholder they want their students to come back for different kind of sometimes for technology sometimes for humanities sometimes for sociology you know because at different phases of your life you realize the importance of different things sometime when you, in india education is not a luxury in a sense still and there is nothing wrong that a student goes out for actually getting a job but at right phase of his life he feels my other things are also important and i would like to look come back but he never prefers going back to his own institution if that there is no connect so when we are looking at the holistic education we should not only just look at the subjects which we are talking about that usko behavioral science padhate ho usko humanities padhate ho wo to theek hai wo to abhi sabhi institutions ne chalu kar diya hai majority of the iits are now getting into medical colleges they already have humanity department they have sociology departments they are certainly doing that you know but holistic education is far beyond that you know the spiritual angle the ethical angle and when we are and as i said the lifelong learning so when our educational institutions will start looking it from that perspective then only i think what we are the actual theme of this that aspect or that goal we will able to achieve thank you thank you very much really appreciate it. thank you dr jere for uh, presenting to us you know say one of course a very inspirational um, you know innovative project pak uh, uh, parak i was going to say prakhar but you know it would have meant almost the same thing but parak and the other was of course the challenges that are faced by academic institutions as well as employing industries you know and how to get along and how to actually confront these issues and come up with a setup which is really productive i would now be inviting uh, uh, ms An 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 anjali hans no i think you know so you should uh, yeah and um, please and um, as uh, our country is becoming more and more digital by the day you know so the need for skilling in this particular sector thank you sir so a lot of things that uh, said resonate uh, you know with uh, what we are doing as an industry connect and Uh, i think what the academia is facing is uh, something that maybe uh, the voice of the industry will answer so i represent the telecom sector skill council and uh, we were set up uh, nearly about a decade back uh, and uh, this was the government recognized the need 
to make the youth skilled and employable, and also to support the industry with skilled manpower. Our founding partners for TSSC are the Cellular Operators Association of India, uh, the uh, Handset Association, the NSDC, which represents the entire spectrum of the uh, uh, digital connectivity ecosystem. Uh, we have about 450 industry associates. I just wanted to talk a little bit about our achievements as well, that over the past decade, uh, we have trained nearly 10 lakh manpower. We've achieved about 65% placements. Uh, we have developed about 58 qualification packs in consultation with the industry on what are their needs and requirements. Uh, we have about 1,000 plus training centers. Uh, we have set up 12 skill labs uh, in the areas of 5G, Internet of Things, handset repair, line assembler, cyber security, and optic fiber. Uh, we have also recently set up a telecom job portal where we have about 232 employers who have currently been onboarded. We have two lakh job seekers, and uh, the top hirers in this as of now are Airtel, Geo, and Siemens. Uh, we also run CSR projects for companies. Uh, we have the Ericsson CSR project, which is being done in collaboration with the Delhi Skill Entrepreneurship University. And we are offering courses mainly on 5G, IoT, cybersecurity. Uh, the Nokia CSR project is being run along with the Koshalya Skill University in Gujarat. Uh, we have a Rotary District 3011 uh, CSR project where we carry out uh, classroom plus uh, blended training. Uh, with Huawei, we've collaborated with NIT Patna, and we are offering courses in 5G, IoT, handset repairs, etc. With SBI cards, uh, we have collaborated with a government girls' college in Gurugram, <coughs> where we are offering training for call center and in-store training. With Vodafone Idea, the collaboration is with the Indira Gandhi Delhi Technical University, where uh, we are offering courses uh, on IoT. Uh, the TSSC has also set up a Telco Learn platform, which is an online platform where we have training courses which are offered both in online as well as physical mode. Uh, we offer certification on those uh, training courses and also assist in placements. Uh, just finish with my achievements and then I'll talk about. Uh, we're also in discussions with the Director General of Training to offer 11 short-term courses uh, in telecom in all the ITIs all over the country. Uh, we work with the MSDE, METI, and state, uh, state skill missions. Uh, we are amongst the top five uh, sector skill councils in the country. Uh, we carry out training both in the uh, train and place model as well as the place and train model. And we find that the place and train model is more effective. Uh, we are trying to get a holistic view of skilling and placement by covering the entire spectrum of skilling requirements, which is by developing the learning, carrying out running courses, and then also assisting in placements, and also having a telecom portal. Uh, it has been, over the 10 years, it has been a productive and fruitful journey. And we believe that given that 5G is going to change the way businesses run and function, and digital is going to become the foundation of the activities of services across various industry verticals, the telecom sector skill council has a very vital role to play in making sure that India's youth is both skilled for future fit environment and also employable and meets the needs of these industries. So I think when uh, Sir was talking about, you know, academia uh, being higher, uh, you know, and internships uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the companies don't know what to do with it. I think the Skill Sector Council provides a very vital link in between because what we do is we ensure that listening to the industry on what are their needs and requirements, we train the people and make them fit for purpose. And then when they go to the companies, then they are actually catering to the skill sets that are required by the company. Uh, so, uh, to that extent, I think maybe it's a vital stepping stone that needs to be built in. Uh, we've already started getting, like I said, into the ITIs. We are also in some government schools. We are in the academic field. Uh, 
skill learning in whichever field. I talk particularly about telecom because that's an area I'm familiar with. But maybe skilling as a part of the curriculum going forward, making sure that they are employable and they, they meet the demands. The demands of the industry are constantly changing. What was needed maybe 10 years ago is not what is needed today. Those jobs have become redundant, you know. There is some research which says that, you know, 63 million jobs are going to go with the, you know, the skilling, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning that is coming in. But then equally they say about 83 million jobs will be created. But for those 83 million jobs to be created, you need to skill, reskill, upskill the youth to make sure that they are employable for the new roles. So uh, not agreeing too much with, you know, um, that the human being is an insect or <laughs> not, he's a general thing. I think fit for purpose, future fit is something that needs to be recognized both by the academia as well as the sector skill councils, which then will ensure that necessary training, which is a need and demand of the industry, to make the youth employable is a need of the hour. Thank you. Thank you, Vishans, for uh, presenting to us the challenges that industry faces and, of course, recognizes the need or the responsibility that it has to create a workforce that's skilled in, in that particular area. I will now be inviting Mr. Ramaswamy to come here and talk about you know, some different models that could be followed you know, for a linkage between academia and industry. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chobi. The toughest thing in such seminars would be the last speaker before lunch. <laughs> so I'll try and do my best. Uh, th there is, thank you. And especially in front of such a learned audience and of course illustrious uh, speakers before me, I'm going to take a step back. We discussed a lot about the modalities. We discussed <coughs> a lot about what is happening currently in the industry academia relationship in holistic education and how these are being imparted or not being imparted in that sense. I come from a community that is very different. Like I'm neither an educator nor an industry nor a regulator. We advise all these people, right? And so I have a ringside view of what is happening there and I'm going to share some of my wisdom that I collected from these things. So uh, I'm going to talk about, like I said, a different perspective of how I see an industry academia collaboration happening. I would say if we can pause and reimagine how industry and academia should work together. Why are we getting caught in the warp of how things are happening, the way it happened or didn't happen. And I see a huge kind of opportunity lying in front of us. To me there are five models of engagement that industry and academia can do. And in parts, they have been doing it. Many of it happening in India, but like uh, Manish said, anything that happens in parts or that is not replicable is not useless. So I would want these five models of engagement by industry, academia together that can scale up, right? I'll tell you what are the five models and see how much of them are happening and what are some of the examples as we go. The most uh, common thing is they say, why isn't industry le reaching out to academia? Well, that's what everybody says. Can industry reach out to academia? So industry reaching to academia is one model. Academy, academic institutions reaching out to industry is also happening. That is the second model that I'm speaking about. And then there's a third model where industry <coughs> builds academic institutions. Right? There are many occasions where industry takes ownership and builds academic institutions. And there are examples where the reverse happening. Academic institutions incubate and build a lot of industries that have emerged and happening. I'll talk about these things. The last one is where I'm very curious where academia and industry come together and co-create value that is going to be of purpose for the world that we live in. Right? So if I start with where industry goes to academia, Normally, we talk about only a few aspects like, for example, can industry help in define curriculum or can industry do internships, can they take people and at best today we are talking about professors of practice and other stuff where 
industry comes industry comes to academia and like you know it's a part of the ecosystem i see this a little more holistically in future right from students recruitment is going to happen from industry we are talking about and again i think uh, manish mentioned about this lot of students are not going to learn they are going to earn and then they are going to come back to learn so how can academia look at industry right from student recruitment the future students are going to come a lot from industry and nep talks about that the multiple entry and exit model we only talk about multiple exit a multiple entry is also going to happen we are going to have different kind of students entering into the educational ecosystem starts with students with faculty i mean we talked about professors of practice in one of the assignment that we are working we did the reverse we said why can't the teachers go to industry and work there for a few months here is a model that we are talking where they are employed together simultaneously by industry and academia so they don't belong to any one particular category in that sense that is working a lot so they go back to industry and speak a lot more knowledgeable about what happens in the academic world and get the rigor and vice versa of course we talking about curriculum curriculum is not just about being in the board of studies and defining what is the curriculum we are clearly moving from pedagogy to what is called as hetagogy right we are not talking about uh, especially in higher education institutions where you don't talk about where there is a learning is one way so we are talking about how peer to peer learning should happen how do you create an environment where learning happens across and not just inside the classroom and i believe industry can play a big role in defining curriculum in bringing in hetagogy another area where industry can play a role again when is here is in assessments assessments is a very big area where today if you ask me to put a finger on the pie and say what should be you know one of those reforms that should happen first it is the way assessments are done because assessments leads to everything it defines not just the curriculum it also defines what kind of courses that we take and hence eventually what kind of jobs get generated of course in, in internships and placements i also believe industry can play a big role in governance and funding models so that's my academia into industry i mean uh, industry into academia similarly we are also talking about how academic institutions have gone to industry work integrated learning program is a model that you know bit spilani pioneered at one point of time there are many in this many academic institutions that have taken to that where you build a small little university in the in the industry <laughs> if your learners can't come to your uh, you know campus you take the university to their workplace you kind of involve people who are in the hierarchy as a part of the learning teaching process as a part of the assessment process so this has worked out well and we are going to see this happening in a big way we are going to see micro credits happening we talking about uh, uh, you know a national digital university which is going to bring in industry with their own courses to teach where academic and academia and industry can work together we also worked with a client where uh, um, an mba program was co created along with one of the leading universities and that created far better human resources for the industry so i think there is a proactive role that industry can uh, and academia can take where academia goes to industry and create a microcosm of education learning environment in the industry the third which is interesting is uh, very interesting is where academia building uh, industry right silicon valley is a great example the entire high tech industry has happened because educational institutions in california in, in that part of the world started creating absolutely new industry which is kind of dominating the world today and there are many more examples of that happening we have our own example here in iit madras research park where there are institutions that are creating new formats new sectors new formats of jobs and hence this is going to continue and in my view academic institution have a responsibility in incubators in accelerators in a manner in which they can actually define how sectors are happening similarly industry in many occasions has created educational institutions here i want to talk about a lot of private institutions in india in different parts of the world that have happened because industry has decided to create these educational institutions right it could be 
one of the one of the early projects that we worked on is a PPP model, where uh, uh, you know a set of institutions or a set of companies in a particular sector should come together along with the academic institution and create a new format. I'm talking about the triple IT that have formed. Now we have more than uh, uh, 20 triple ITs today and all these have formed because IT companies got together, worked along with an institution to form a new category of institutions. And it's not just the philanthropic capital that needs to work. We are looking at how there again regulators also play a role. If there is a means of bringing in capital into the educational world, which today, uh, to put it mildly, is very tough. And if that can happen, I'm sure the industry participation in creating new institutions is going to go up. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not as if it's happening only here. There are models. I, I was very interested in three models that worked in uh, uh, similar such geographies where scale was matter, was a big concern in China, in Korea, and Mongolia, where in, in I, I'll, I'll be very brief in this, where in China, the Beijing Agricultural School is a good example where China decided to take on the agriculture sector in a big way. So they created this Beijing Agricultural School, which was a catalyst in the rural part of China, getting on to the education bandwagon. They actually created the school. That was industry coming there and creating that. Similarly, the Sangyo, textile specialized schools that was created in uh, Korea, where in a place where it was, a, it was a cluster of textile companies and they decided to bring in educational institutions there where the industry will be the training partners for them. And similarly, the number seven school concept in Mongolia, where they brought in early stage from schools to the arts and crafts colleges there working along with the technical institutions, similar to our uh, ITIs here. How do we bring in <coughs> schools and regular education colleges to work with ITIs? But the last model which is very interesting is how can education institutions, industry come together to create something of value for the industry? That has also happened here, but unfortunately, it's not happened in a structured manner, and I don't know whether it is replicable, like, you know, be it in terms of creating a vaccine when there is a crisis. Of course, people stood up, and there was something that we literally created a world record of sorts. And similarly, when the government decided to bring in Swachh Bharat and Clean India, a lot of educational institutions and private players came together and came up with solutions in solid waste management that was never seen before. But this is happening more like serendipity and not something that is being done in a structured manner. So I would like to close by saying industry and academia can come together in far more means than we all think today. We need to reimagine the way we can come together. So and like I said, the model of industry coming to academia, academia going to industry, academia creating new industries, industries creating new academic institution, and last day coming together for a higher purpose, creating these assets and value for the civil society, and particularly in the context of India, this academic institution and industry coming together could serve in creating the human resources for the world. The rest of the world is going geriatric. They are looking at India to create this workforce. Can we come together and be uh, a place where the entire world, or good part of the world, can look up to us for human resources? With this, Thanks for the opportunity once again, and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. I think this was a wonderful presentation, and in a way, uh, a good response to problems uh, uh, that we have discussed you know, um, through the session of uh, how can the academia and industry work together to come up with uh, uh, long uh, lasting solutions, you know, creating uh, uh, you know, a community of uh, young innovators thinking holistically, thinking in a comprehensive way, always alive to problems that are emerging in a fast changing world. And how could this fusion lead to long lasting and impactful uh, consequences. So I would now we have we are running against time, you know. So we have about uh, five minutes, and that's what uh, I know for very crisp and well structured questions. You know, so make sure please that these are very tight questions. Yes, please. So I think I'm loud enough. I can go ahead. I'm Professor Chakravarti from IIT Bombay from the design school there. So the biggest challenge for us is how much 
general education, how much industry push education. So this is the struggle we are facing because the schools which don't have good teachers are sending them, sending the students to industry, and surprisingly they're doing well. But the schools which have good resources are trying to do everything themselves, and sometimes they're losing, sometimes they're gaining. So you know, I want to ask the panel, what do they think about this? Anybody who would like to take this question, I think uh, Dr. Jere. Hello. So, so basically, this is my personal point of view, and not AICT point of view. Okay. Uh, let me. Yeah. What I believe is that in this uh, world of emerging technologies, where technologies are changing at such a rapid pace, two years, three years, every time you have something. What we should actually teach is only one thing, how to learn, how to skill and reskill yourself. So nothing more than that. You know, that is the most important thing, what we should teach. And the basic fundamentals that are extremely critical. Okay? Technology is skill This is my personal view. You know? There are multiple uh, dimensions, but this is a very simplistic way of saying it, but yeah. Thank you. So stay grounded. Uh, the gentleman there first, please, and then we would come back to you. Uh, my, I think I'm audible. Uh, my question is first to Mr. Sabawar and uh, Mr. Ramaswamy. I mean, uh, we have, uh, yeah. because I think both of you spoke about learning while, uh, earning while learning, uh, sorry, employability. So South Korea around 2017 came out with this policy of employability first and education next after we get gross enrollment ratio country of over 100 percent because seeing that people are not getting the right of skill, especially look at obsolescence sense of skill. So in this context, how do you look at, I mean both of you spoke about it and they found that therefore skill and obsolescence sense to do, we have to do a employability first education next. So where do you see that happening and any data because it's already seven years since they have done it. And now we are talking about the holistic education of living, skilling, industry, and employment. And but then our skill sector is high every whether from medical to health to electronics to engineering. We have edu education foundation doesn't link to uh, whatever is needed in skilling. And before you start the skill, it becomes obsolete. So how do we think? Can we move towards uh, truly employability first and skilling next with lifelong learning as a key? Good question. Hello, uh, good question. The fact is, by the time educational institutions gear up, and they even if they look up to industry and kind of define their curriculum, things are changing in industry. So if you have a three-year course or a five-year course or whatever it is, by the time the youngster completes all these things and goes, it's become obsolete. So in my view, the only way is to keep having the osmosis and reverse osmosis keep happening. And that is where I think unless they are connected together, rather than be two different institutions who will have to work, you know, and pass on to the next one and then come back. Unless you work together, this will not happen. And I think there are many uh, avenues for that to happen provided in the national education policy. So as we move and implement these things, I'm sure there will be avenues where you can bridge this gap. I'm not sure whether you can completely do away with it. I mean, as in you earn for first and then come back to learn or you completely learn and then go to earn. This will continue. But lifelong learning is the only solution for this. I mean, the only, I mean, the only solution is really just the middle path, you know. Madhya Mark is always good advice. I don't think we can choose between education and employability. We're trying to establish a continuum. I mean, 50% of taxi drivers in Korea have a college degree. 31% of Walmart checkout clerks in the US have a college degree. So the massifying of college education is actually a requirement of democracy. It may not be a requirement of employers. But um, let's just make peace with it and move on. You know, Michael Spence got his Nobel Prize for his work on the social signaling value of, um, of higher education. But I think Narayan's point about just making the system more self-healing you know, if the system is self-healing, then you, and if you have linkages, then you tend to listen more on both sides. I mean, 
is, are you the waiter or the chef? I mean, is the employer the chef or the waiter? I'm not sure. I've always thought about it. Is the university a waiter who just delivers what employers want? Or do empl does supply create its own demand? Or does demand create its own supply? I mean, there's a ch chicken and egg problem. And the only way to solve a chicken and egg problem is to become vegetarian, which is do something, <laughs> do something different. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, yes, ma'am, you had a question. Hello, am I audible? So with due respect, I want to congratulate all the panelists for their words of wisdom. And I, being from health sector, I'm Dr. Neelam Mishra. I'm Vice Chancellor of Krishna Vishwavidya Pit, Karad, Maharashtra. So from being health sector, in our uh, leader students, we have introduced uh, this uh, in, in, uh, CBS, in competency based medical education. That is from the first year onwards. That is, the competency is the skill aspect. They have been improved. This is applied from 2019 to 20 onwards. Now our students, they are having uh, additional aspect of skilling. They know how to, the, 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 word, the communication skill, everything it has added in the course. So uh, this uh, holistic education, that is involvement of head through heart to the hands. The cognitive domain, the psychomotor domain accordingly. So this competency-based medical education is including all the aspects. So in our medical as well as with engineering, so many innovations with, uh, in unity they can perform. So many innovations they can do. This is sort of suggestion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> we have time for maybe one more question, please. And uh, yes. in health but not elsewhere because maybe human being may be the only target for medicine but engineering and other fields are for whole society so probably we have moved to a very narrow intelligence that is AI bringing that to its own limitation our education needs to come out of this limitation that we have brought more insects probably through education than human beings so I will see that any people could probably broaden it now with various policies uh, more into this aspect of broadening the education than more into specialization and branches in engineering of technical education and all that. So I would see that probably we need to have a shift and bring, come out of this narrow intelligence to holistic education or broad intelligence of human beings. That's right, sir. Command, probably that's how we have to work. It's already afoot. I think, you know, we are trying to get rid of the insects and create uh, a system where uh, the young learners start connecting with the world, start connecting with themselves. And uh, as, as uh, Dr. Jerry had pointed out, you know, uh, to actually acquire holistic education in all its, um, you know, comprehensiveness, so to say. You connect with the community, you know, you go out there, you know, say, meet people, watch them do things, engage in activities that helps you understand the world better, right? And, and whatever it is that you acquire this way, your experience, you use it to inform your specialization. So you need, you could become, you have to become a specialist, but you also need to know, understand the context in which you would be practicing your specialization, right? And that is how the two help each other. Could I just? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I would come back to my earlier response of Madhya Marg. You know, we should design a system which makes people who want generalists or specialists both unhappy. <laughs> I think that if you design, if you make both of them happy, one of them the other other happy, you're not going to get it right. You need to make people who want pure generalists unhappy, and you want people who make specialists also unhappy. Will be the system where at least you will. You know, I don't I don't really distinguish between learning for earning and learning for living. I know a lot of people talk about learning for living. I don't understand how you live without. Uh, may I? Oh, what, that, that, that'll be the last one. <coughs> so we are already gone beyond time. So yes, please. So uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, panel discussion. Uh, one of the issues which I find is that it talks about holistic education, but everything is being talked about from the technical 
you know, education perspective. And I think that's why there are some un questions which are uh, remaining unanswered. One which uh, Professor Chakradev uh, Chakrabarti asked, uh, what should be the balance and so on? And you talked about several models. And there is a model which probably nobody has talked about is that you work with a community for some time and then you come uh, and, uh, you know, develop a campus. This is where what we have done at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences and cracked a whole lot of issues which probably will provide you answers. What should be the you know, mix? Who are the people who do the internship supervision? It's credited. It is uh, uh, completely credited. Make the students uh, ready for the job, uh, but not for uh, you know, technical institutions, but for the society and for the development sector, the largest uh, products come out uh, for the development sector. However, we are now faced with a problem, and that's why I want to ask Professor Jere uh, what would be the solution. So now that we are having skill education in a big way, for example, our BWOC program, Bachelor of Vocational Education program, which is with entry exit model and lifelong learning kind of a thing, has grown bigger than the, uh, the institute itself. So it, it is admitting more students than the institute is doing in all its 57 programs. But the problem is, how do we hire faculty who will uh, align with the UGC's prescribed norms of employment, and therefore uh, we lose out on the you know te uh, the teacher-student ratio uh, thing when we are going for the NIRF. Uh, so if we want to grow big, we are going growing big for GER. But if we grow big we are losing out on faculty because we cannot hire faculty who have the relevant qualifications to get uh, admitted or to get hired for vocational education. You know, we don't have those kind of faculty with PhD in vocational education and even an MA in a vocational education. So uh, I think we have to bridge a little bit of a gap there uh, and then say that skilling holistic education will involve, include both social sciences and technical institution. This panel was great, but it was slightly lopsided. Uh, do forgive Thank me, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> but this was something that I did point out. You know, so you cannot really have a holistic e education, you know, without yeah. you know really immersing yourself with the students. You know, I'm, I'm, when I say student, I'm also counting on faculty, teachers, you know, as being the students. You know, so nobody is actually essentially a teacher. You know, for that, you know, you would have to get the title or claim the title of a guru. So. Unless you are exposed or immersed in the community, and that's what I said, you know, so our parents or our system always, while growing up as kids, it stops us from connecting with the community. And that is something that institutions have to do. That is something that we at the Design Institute at the time, a part of, has been doing from the very first semester. All these kids coming in, you know, uh, after finishing their school have to connect with the community and it's this system, work with the community, you also learn in the classroom, but what exactly. you're learning in the classroom is basically you know, uh, illuminated or enhanced by what you learn with the community. Yeah, and but this, that's, this system yeah. continues till the 10th semester, so it's a five year long setup where you identify a problem and you work on solving that problem in teams so it's something which is happening, and I think this is something which uh, is, is a, such a wonderful um, inclusion in the new education policy. Yeah. There but would be attending the, problems. There that's would not be the parameter. That's not the parameter against which you are judged in the NIRF and so on. Absolutely, so, yeah. You know, you make an impact on policy or in the development sector, but uh, you don't get uh, any brownie marks for that. Uh, I'm sure it is now being looked into. So that, is, that is what will happen. Yeah. Since we don't have much time, what I'm sure. saying is that you know, this is a great start. But of course, the systems will follow. You know, it's only an evolving um, system. And of course, you know, so whatever lags there are, you know, so will be taken care of. So I'm sorry, you know, so it was a question meant for you, but I kind of uh, very rudely, yep. No, no it's okay. The, the kind of question which you have asked, actually we'll have another panel discussion for that, because <laughs> it's a big question which you have asked. Yeah? But again, when we are, and Madam, please understand, when you say holistic education, you yourself, because of your uh, background from Tata Institute of Social Science, you were focused on social studies that we have not raised it. But when we are talking about, and that also happened with us, the panel. So we both are guilty on those aspects. But having said this, these barriers are going to get over, or they are going to get diluted phenomenally. 
moving forward. And the only reason for that is the way the entire sector is evolving. Madam, please understand, a kid, millennial kid, and I tell this now at majority of the uh, panel discussions or talks, a millennial kid who is born after is going to live for 90 years, 95 years, you know, because of the uh, increase in life expectancy, medical uh, domain changes, you know, quality of life and so on and so forth. It means he has to remain professionally relevant for at least 50, 55 years because he has to work till 75. Otherwise, he will not be able to support himself for last 15, 20 years because there is no social security in that sense, right? So a person there becomes graduate at 22 yeah? and then he has to work till 75. Nobody can predict what kind of technology it is required what kind of sectors are going to, uh, whether from a social sciences perspective or from a technology core engineering type perspective. So, as Sir was rightly saying, there has, the students have to come back to schools again and again and retrain themselves. However, the maturity, the mentality, the expectations from life are going to change at every phase of his, you know. So, as, as you rightly, so means if you have to talk about justice or social sciences and those kind of things, they are, those are going to get integrated, you know, because expectations from life at different phases is different, apart from skills. And that is the reason when I was answering him, uh, Professor Chakrabarti, that what you re really require is only a mindset where you have to skill and reskill again. Otherwise, it's not possible for you to actually survive. That's the brutal reality. Uh, and also, professors of practice is already accepted. Yes. I think it is wrong to assume that you need only these qualifications. There are many vocational schools that have started hiring people from industry, and you don't need that strict conditions anymore, sir, if I can add. Yes. So that's incorrect, ma'am. You can have more than, you don't need PhDs anymore. So thank you. I think this is a conversation that could continue because we are talking about future. Thank you very much, all the panelists, and for all of you to be here.